Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Polland. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight we welcome two distinguished guests, Dr. Jim Granato, Director of the University of Houston's Hobby Center for Public Policy and Professor at the University of Houston's Department of Political Science, and George Ball, Chairman of Sanders Morris Harris Group. Welcome, gentlemen. So you guys, I guess, are ready to tell us everything at all uh, that we need to know about how it was that the financial overhaul, the financial reform law, uh, recently passed and signed into law by the by the president is uh, going to help us or not? What is your sort of broad view of, of, of the matter, Mr. Granado? The Dodd-Frank bill, which is 2,300 pages, and I confess I've not read a lot of it, but I've looked at the highlights. The thing I was looking for was an end to too big to fail, and unfortunately that did not occur in this bill. What we need is to have a situation in which the taxpayers are not footing the bill for uh, business mistakes, not only by the financial sector, but also by any other sector, be it autos, airline industry, any industry. And what the Dodd-Frank bill with the financial industry is they basically have too big to fail left intact. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ball, uh, I'm assuming that you're in agreement with this position, but, you know, what, what's the alternative? I mean, we have, we have these giants, and we, we can't just dissolve them. Jim's right. The biggest beneficiary of the bill are the big banks. Uh, it was designed in some fashion or another to humble them or to tether them, and it may have them tethered, but it's tethered into a position of invulnerability. Oddly, probably the best part of the bill, I think, is going to be the saving impact on the U.S. citizen before the next failure of the economy and the, of the financial system. The bill does that uh, rather well, not neatly, but rather well. But in terms of who benefits, people say it's the community banks. That's not true. People say it's the small investor. That's certainly not true. It is the big banks and some other ancillary groups. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how, how did we end up in this situation? Uh, I certainly have my own opinion, but I'm going to ask you since you're all the guests. Uh, we, had one, we had a bubble economy, we know, uh, over the last 10 years, one bubble after another blowing up. Uh, this most recent bubble, uh, which caused the financial uh, crisis that we faced in the fall of 2008, what caused it? Greed. Greed and leverage. Uh, they tend to go hand in hand. I mean, this, this gets back to the gr days of the Greek tragedies. And if people think there's anything new in this last bubble, they're, they're kidding themselves. Uh, there, there's not. Uh, you can call it animal spirits, you can call it speculation, uh, it's greed, and regulation doesn't curb greeds. Now, I think in retrospect, you can give both the Bush and the Obama administrations high marks for, for in an extemporaneous fashion, uh, avoiding the calamity of the financial system shutting down. And if it had uh, shut down, we'd all be in caves. But the underlying roots of, of the financial system meltdown uh, aren't going to be cured by a bill, much less the one that just passed. And Jim, we're going to be in caves, uh, many people are, because the housing uh, part of this problem hasn't been resolved. I think you uh, accept that something more needs to be done with Fannie Mae and Correct. Freddie. What, do you, what, what, is the, what are those remedies? The first thing is, let's talk about these bubbles for a second. We've had bubbles for tulips. Okay, so markets create bubbles. The issue is when they break, who has to pay for the bubble? So it when the should, tulips broke, who pay? Yeah, exactly. So it's the people that are investing it. It's in this, in our, in other instances, it's the shareholders. The people that took the risk have to bear the brunt. They get the profits, but they also have to get the loss. Now, in terms of housing, one of the things that the bill could have done and did not do was it could have eliminated Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, just said you no longer exist. And what they could have done instead is if you really want to subsidize low-income home ownership, you put it on the budget. And we debate it there, but it's on the budget. But what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did was they actually backstopped a good deal of risky borrowing, and they led to what we call a moral hazard. And that's the thing, that, and that's a big part of this bill that is not stopped. Moral hazard still continues. So the taxpayers not only are going to have to help pay for what's already ongoing, they're still on the hook for the next crisis. And with the consolidation of the banks, which we're seeing, bigger is, is occurring. 
And so the next crisis could be even bigger than this one, which so has the taxpayers are still on the hook for that as well. Did we end up with problems with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where these, you know, it's this, I don't know, I, they're quasi-federal agencies, they're basically. government sponsored enterprises, yeah, people, correct. Yeah, but people may, you know, but it, they act like they're a private company, but the government backs them when they screw up. It's the worst business model you can have. It's a terrible exactly. business model. But didn't Congress meddle with the standards to make it easier for those who really didn't qualify to buy yes. a house to qualify for a house? And that was the paper that ended up getting blessed, sold, repackaged and ending up in the collapse of AIG uh, to the tune of $182 billion of taxpayer money. Fannie and Freddie, of course, that wasn't enough. They also went to the trough and got $145 billion in, 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 in f- taxpayer money. At some point, this just is insanity. Maybe everyone can't own a house. And, and, and if you wanted to remedy Fannie and Freddie... It would take not only that 145 billion, but another 250 billion. Uh, you you start to get into f- to fairly large numbers, uh, and clearly, and I think Jim would probably agree with this. The the right remedy is to shut Fannie and Freddie down. Uh, the private mortgage market, particularly with the banks assured of a position of being too big to fail, can can handle and have shown in the past that they can handle the reasonable reasonable needs of qualified uh, housing buyers. They'll probably do it much better, much more thoughtfully, if they don't have Fannie and Freddie there to to bail them out exactly. of their bad decisions. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, I remember, you know, 20 years ago when I applied for a mortgage, I had to turn in a, a foot worth of paperwork. I mean, the last three years of tax returns, financial statements, the whole bit. And, and of course, then we get into this era where the bubble occurred of no doc loans, of no down payments, of borrowing the down payment, of pay, of putting the money in the back end and not and making your payment more affordable. I mean, that is just the whole and who system changed, fell and apart. And who changed all these regulations? Who, 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 who do we blame for I mean, this? We can go. Let's go back to the mid '80s. You got the bailout of the con- of Continental Bank, which was done under Paul Volcker's auspices and you know Republican president, Republican Senate, Democratic House. So bo- it's a bipartisan screw up. Following the bailout of Continental Bank, you've got the bailout of Mexico, the Mexican banks. You've got the Asian crisis following there. And every time we're bailing out, taxpayers are bailing yeah. out these private entities. And, it, and it It's a great deal. And, 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 <laughs> and, and when you look at the participants, you might call them the co-conspirators, in the housing disaster, it's the body politic, the politicians encouraging these government-sponsored entities right. to have laxer and laxer standards, which let... Nice Wall Streeters like me develop uh, uh, new so, so-called uh, uh, rocket science tree, which is nothing more than uh, uh, Ponzi scheme to arithmetic in some cases, to uh, develop securities that could be sold to unwitting uh, institutions. And so you had politicians, you had the Wall Streeters, uh, and you, you probably had... Uh, the home buyers too. What about, the, working what, hand about the hand. Home, what about the home builders? What about the real estate uh, developers? What about the the, the, the sales uh, people? Uh, I mean, they all were loving this as well. Uh, the you know <laughs> they the, made money. The, yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and you know, the, all of their packs were in support. Yes. You know that of all of these great the, uh, initiatives. lobbyists. You mean lobbyists? Right. Because you. In the end of the day, it was Fannie Mae in particular, but the government intervention that was going to backstop all this risk. And so if, you, if you're a private enterprise and, and, you, and you know the government's going to bail you out and assume these risks you're taking, you're going to engage in this. Right. And let me add something else here. Um, AIG is a great example of just of how this kind of concludes. You've got Continental in the mid-80s. You've got all these bailouts of these major institutions. AIG, when it started to have trouble, it has four component parts, three of which were profitable. And what they did was they held out for the best deal they could. If they go to pro- the private market, they're going to get hammered. The, the, the manager's going to get hammered. They're going to, they're going to liquidate assets, and they're going, to, they're going to be transformed into something new. And, but the stockholders would have paid, and the shareholders, the people that, that own AIG would have paid the price, not anybody else. What's happened, again, is the burden has been shifted to the taxpayers. What I call it is we've socialized risk and we privatize gain. And it's a bad business model. That's exactly right. I mean, and so why should, when you, there's no limit to the risk if you figure exactly. that somebody else will pick up the check. A, it, we've got another crisis waiting to happen. And that's, what happened. Happen. It, it's and that's happen basically again. what happened on Wall Street. It's exactly right. And so both, let's talk about the main, let's talk about, it. let's talk about Main Street a while, if, you, if, you, if we can. Uh, the news has not been good uh, for Main Street as well. We've got foreign markets 
in decline. We have our own uh, market down. We have projected unemployment of 10% for a good while. We have billions being spent to just keep people in homes and, 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 and paying their food bills. I mean, where, where does this end for the United States? Well, it's popular to be pessimistic these days. Uh, and you do have the paradox of Republicans behaving like Democrats and Democrats behaving like Republicans for reasons that I can't quite understand, but they all seem to want to run against each other. Uh, probably the best thing that may happen is that, as was true in the 1990s, the, the body populace, the, the voters, are going to say, I want to disempower the president and I want to disempower the other party. So if these people don't do anything at all, if they stalemate each other, we, we the people will make things all right. So you're talking about the Clinton Republican Congress uh, model that took place in the late 90s. Yeah, and, and you know, the Republican Congress could veto what Clinton wanted. He could block what the Republicans wanted. And the economy actually did quite well. And there were some, some bad things happening at the, at the fringes. But I think the American voter uh, has lost confidence in both parties at this point in time. No, I, th I think there's something to that. Of course, you talk about the pessimistic uh, agenda and potential. I just started looking at some statistics. We have a record number of people on food stamps, 40.8 million people. We've had zero interest rates for a year and a half, and the economy isn't really not done much with that. Uh, our jobs numbers are bad, and I actually happen to believe that the unemployment rate is gross, grossly understated, and I'm going to see what you think, because they don't count people who give up seeking employment. They don't count those who've decided to take early retirement, take their Social Security early because they don't have the, they don't think there's any hope of finding a job. So this economy, after uh, the Obama administration has dropped north of a trillion dollars, really hadn't done much. So where does that leave us? What's the, what's the optimistic viewpoint? That's another way of asking the same question I just, right. I just asked. Well, we have had periods in our country's history where the economy has recovered in spite of government involvement. I mean, you can talk about the 19, early 1920s. Even when the stock market crashed in 1929, there was a resurgence in employment after, by June of 1930, in which unemployment went from about 9% down to about 6.5%. It did without any government intervention at all. But what's really going on is there's massive uncertainty out there. And, and what has to happen is we, we've lost control in some sense of, 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 of Who's responsible for taking risks here? We're spreading risk to people, to the taxpayer. But in addition, the taxpayers and the private sector is always get, always also getting hit with the impending debt increase that's coming at the federal level. If we continue on our path, we'll be at a 90% ratio of, of public spending to GDP. And that's a level which you start to see real trouble. Is that when the United States becomes Greece? Well, no. in, in, <laughs> in, 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 as things stand now in 2015, the United States becomes Greece. Our, 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 our debt to GDP uh, ratio is 100 percent, and we're, 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 we're Greece, and, and there are a lot of very bad things that are uh, implicit and explicit uh, uh, in that. Um, and I think what the, the American people are saying is, you know, to raise $100 billion by taxing the wealthiest 1% uh, at a higher rate, or even to raise $300 billion by doing away with the Bush tax cuts for the middle class uh, isn't, isn't going to solve that problem, that there's some more fundamental, structural, major, and at least semi-permanent steps that have to be taken. And neither party and none of the politicians are talking seriously about those sorts of fundamental overhauls that can actually uh, uh, avoid the greasization of the United You're States. You're talking about entitlement reforms? Or, or, I mean, because surely, surely the math is correct that we cannot just give away seven hundred billion dollars to the to three hundred and fifteen thousand families who would who would be taxed if we suspended uh, the uh, Bush tax cut. We surely don't really care that much about what that crowd does with their money. What have they done with it in the past when they got their tax cuts, and who benefited from that yeah. spending? The, um, I think what we need to do is to look at entitlements and taxes as one. In other words, someplace along the way, you have to raise a trillion and a half dollars a year. Uh, you know, otherwise, you get into a situation where there's massive currency debasement starting 
Jim in 2014-15, so that the same. mean the dollar just starts collapsing in value? The dollar starts collapsing in value. Inflation is rampant. Interest rates go way, way up. Uh, but but the country becomes balkanized, and, and at, at best or at worst, all the savings of people are dissipated. Uh, and, and that's a very real danger three years down the road. So between now and two or three or four years uh, from now, we have to raise, ta- raise income, the, the income of the government massively and cut what it spends massively. Cutting what it spends is probably uh, most properly done, a lot of people would say, Paul Volcker would say, by raising the uh, Social Security uh, uh, age limits to 70 in some fairly quick steps. And even a Republican like me might argue for a value-added tax uh, or a consumption tax on incomes over some Somebody level. Are you ready to get rid of the income tax as part of the trade? I, That's I, the question. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one point of optimism and one point of pep- pessimism here. The first is, be, in, since World War II, there's been one time we've had a mass reduction in government spending, which is another, we have to focus on this a lot, I believe, too, to, to make this work. The government spent 41% of our GDP in 45 we then have this massive demobilization, and so government share of GDP goes from 41 to 24 to 14. Almost all of it came from defense. Now, while that was going on, unemployment goes from 2% to 4%, which is, even though that's a doubling, I'll take that, won't you? 4% yeah, that'd unemployment? Be great. The other thing you saw was private investment went up extremely quickly to make up for the shortfall in government intervention. Public, private consumption also went up. So that's why we didn't see this depression. Now, the problem is, in, at the national level, the federal level, the reductions in spending came out of defense. And we need to come out this time on the domestic side. And I know of no example at the federal level since 1945 where we've had a systematic reduction in domestic spending. And the big target, the one that's really causing the trouble, is Medicare. We need a generational solution with that, and that's going to be extremely difficult. Yeah, and in fact, if you look back in the history of the deals that were made previously, Reagan made a deal the, for a tax cut and agreed to cut spending or, when, no, tax increase. They make these deals. We'll increase in taxes and cut right. spending, except the spending cuts never happen. Right. And, and, and I think it's fair to say, I mean, both parties have spent money. I mean, look, the Republicans in Congress got in trouble toward the later end of the Bush administration because all the money they were spending, which upset the Republican base. You're spending money like drunken sailors, and of course that was still the Democrats came well, in and, Mr. and Ball, blew uh, that away. Uh, someone who disagrees with Mr. Pollan here is David Stockman, who budget director for Mr. Reagan, and Republican congressman, who has written recently that all of this started, this decline, when we embraced deficit spending at, at the Reagan, uh, in the Reagan era, when Cheney Vice President Cheney said, well, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. And then George Bush takes two wars off the books and a prescription drug bill as well as two tax cuts and borrowed to pay for it all. So why isn't David Stockman right, is, which is that there's a certain part of the population supporting these Republicans who believe this stuff, this nonsense, that are, are responsible for where we all are today? Well, at the... Tax cuts, whether you're talking Reagan era or or, or Bush era, are, are are a nice idea, and, and certainly tax cuts you know, create more money in people's pockets, and they they can spend it, and there's a multiplier effect, and that that's all good. Uh, however, to think that you can cure a trillion and a half dollar a, a year problem by quote growing your way out of it is, is specious. It's it's not going to happen. There there have to be some major changes that will bring in more income whether you call it a value-added tax or, uh, or something else that's massive. And it's not tinkering around with uh, a 5% increase in capital gains taxes on 1% of the population. That, that may help because it makes people feel better, but it's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, but isn't it fair to say, George, that when, when we had the Reagan tax cuts... Uh, that there was an increase in the economy, which resulted in an increase in revenue to the government. That revenue grew on, while President, yeah. on President Reagan's watch because of the Reagan tax cuts. And, and there absolutely is a dynamic that, that works in the economy. Cut taxes, people have more money, spend more money, creates jobs, and that works. But again, there's, there, there is a limit to it. Well, and, and as like Dr. Granada said, if you don't get control of spending as part of that, then it's not going to work. And in essence, that's what happened under Reagan's tax cut. Revenue yeah. went up, but spending went up faster. Well, one of the hard things right now 
is everybody wants to cure the economy and unemployment rates overnight. Um, uh, I can remember a few times in college, not for many years, when I, when I drank too much. And, and, and I got up the next day, and, and uh, probably if I'd had a beer to start the day off, I would have felt better for a while. But the, then things would have devolved from there. And, and, and the problem with our, with our economy and, and with unemployment and with a lot of these things is you've had a binge that's lasted four to 14 years. Sort of, sort of count it as you weigh, as you would. And, and we need to cure it in stages. Just, you know, when, when, I, when I got up, I, I should have gone out for a run and then yeah, done, gone to the gym. <laughs> you, dated, you dated yourself with that beer <laughs> break. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Granato, uh, what is the purpose traditionally of recessions in a, in a free market economy? Well, they, well at least in theory. In theory, it's supposed, to, it's supposed to help root out the firms that are unprofitable. And, the, and the, what you hope is that the, the length of these things aren't severe. I should add something, too. In the, we, if you go back to 1850, National Bureau of Economic Research tracks business cycles, recessions, expansions. The, the average expansion is about 30 months. We had, between 1960 and 2000, the average expansion for the one in the 60s, one in the 80s, one in the 90s was 106 months. And it had to do with some things such as inflation stability and, and cutting tax rates. The thing about taxes is important. It, it's a pipe dream to think that when you cut taxes that, that revenues are going to match that. But if we would have, say, if Ray, Ronald Reagan would have frozen spending for four years, frozen at 82 levels, by 87 you would have had a balanced budget. What, so do, governmental, I'm sorry, what do governmental mm -hmm. leaders need to do, if anything? I mean, I, I assume that you all are not just willing to entrust the market to resolve this, and you probably see the advantages of having political leadership that knows how to talk to our people about what is at stake here. Who so what, 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 is, what is the vision thing that is missing, do you think, in the public dialogue such that so many Americans have given up on this economy improving and this country improving? I, I, I think that Americans have not given up on the economy or on the country. They've given up on politicians. Politicians aren't talking to each other. So if a Republican wants one thing, the Demo Democrat immediately doesn't. Uh, and I think what the American people want is, is something that would be b along the lines of what Jim's talking about, which is, all right, wh 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 what is our tax program going to be for the next five years? How do we get the Medicaid, Medicare uh, health costs under control? Because nobody believes that the last bill is actually going to be a revenue raiser. Uh, it may be, but uh, no, since nobody can understand it, they, they, can't, uh, they can't prove it. And find some way to cut... Uh, the government spending in a major way, yeah, and, and, and then again, perhaps to find new tax bases. I mean, do, if you th you do you think we're not asking the right question, uh, George, which is maybe we should be stepping back and saying, let's look in, in the 21st century, in a modern economy, what kind of tax system should we have? What kind of government should we have? And how do we pay for it? Aren't, don't we need to go back to the fundamental questions here? Because things are so far past what anything like that. Absolutely, and, and I, I think what it what I believe at least, is that tinkering around the edges isn't going to get us any, anything other than the good fight where everybody gets to poke each other in the eye. Uh, you know, we need in some fashion or another to have the statesmanlike, you know, we have to make some big changes. And I think, I think the people of the country, in some instinctive way, have gotten there uh, far ahead of the politicians. And, and that's what's causing the well, is it, electoral is, is, it the, is it the Tea Party people that, have, that, are, uh, that we should be listening to, Mr. Granato? I mean, who has the vision uh, dialogue that you, li that you want to have uh, um, talking more? Well, um, can I just pick one program? Let's talk about Medicare. I mean, the straight talk I like to hear is basically the program has an incentive compatibility. That is, your individual decisions that you're doing for your own health care, for your medical care, creates a situation in which we're busting the budget. And so straight talk there would be we have to do, we have to reform Medicare so that you are responsible for paying more of your health care, period. You have the freedom to choose all kinds of options, and we want to expand the market so you can do that. But it has to be that we localize the cost with an individual's choices. And that means people have to pay more. The question will be, do we pay more in the sense that they're going to raise your taxes for this program in which you have less control of your future, or are you just, instead of raising your taxes, you have to just pay more to take control of the things that you want for medical care? A quick answer from you, Mr. Ball. Is Obama the right message? Uh, he's a tinkerer, I guess, in your view. 
or is it the Congressman Paul Ryan, the guy from Wisconsin, or uh, Sarah Palin, Gingrich, who? The, uh, probably none of the above. If I had to choose from your laundry list, I'd, I'd, I'd choose Ryan because he's specific and, uh, and very pointed in what he says. Uh, and the fact that he's controversial is good. At least it's clear and, uh, and, and it's simple. I, I did want to mention something about a tax system. You said you were talking about a value-added tax, which is essentially a national sales tax a formula basis similar to that. Uh, so do you favor consumption taxes over uh, income taxes or taxes on investment? I, I, think we have, I, I think we have to have a tax that's on top of what exists today. I don't like saying that. If you, get, you have stimulus now or you cut government spending. Uh, well, that's, that's a very short-term look at what's happening today. And the economy will fix itself over time. That's, um, a very, that's, that's the optimism that we want to have when we close out a show. Thank you, George Ball, thank you. Jim Granato, and you too, Mr. Paula. Thank you, David. <laughs> we invite you to, dis- to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Click on the local program bar and choose red, white, and blue. Read about our guests and watch the shows along with our follow-up discussion. And until next time, get informed and get active.